This is Dr. Mimi Lamb from Metro Health Medical Center, and I'd like to help you understand the abnormalities of bone and mineral metabolism that occur in chronic kidney disease. First, we'll go over the way that bone disease develops in patients with CKD. Eventually, we'll work our way through this complicated diagram, but for now, I'll start by describing a hypothesis developed in the 1950s by investigators at Washington University in St. Louis to explain abnormal labs that they observed in their CKD patients. Their so-called trade-off hypothesis goes like this. Think of CKD as occurring in a series of little decrements in GFR. Each decrease in GFR leads to a small increase in serum phosphate because of less excretion, and then to a decrease in serum calcium. The exact mechanism of this reciprocal decrease in calcium wasn't known back in the 50s, so we'll get to that later. Anyway, the low calcium stimulates parathyroid hormone release. PTH corrects the serum calcium and phosphate because it releases calcium from bone and increases its reabsorption by the renal tubules, bringing serum calcium back up to normal. PTH also decreases tubular phosphate reabsorption and increases excretion, bringing the serum phosphate back down to normal. Thus, serum calcium and phosphate return to normal but at the expense of a higher PTH level, hence the name trade-off. As the underlying renal disease progresses, the same steps are repeated. Another tiny drop in GFR, another increase in serum phosphate, a decrease in serum calcium, and a further increase in PTH, which once again allows calcium and phosphate to return to normal. So this series of steps allows serum calcium and phosphate to remain normal in the early and middle stages of CKD, but the trade-off is a gradually increasing PTH level, which progressively damages bones by releasing calcium from them to keep serum calcium normal. Eventually, GFR gets so low that even high levels of PTH can't increase phosphate excretion anymore, and then hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia ensue, and PTH rises even more. So this is part of the story of CKD bone disease, now let's look at the bigger picture. So here's what we know now. Here's the trade-off hypothesis with a decrease in GFR producing that small increase in serum phosphate, decrease in calcium, and increase in PTH. We now know that an increase in phosphate suppresses synthesis of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3 and impairs GI calcium absorption leading to hypocalcemia. 125 production is also suppressed by renal disease itself, which damages and scars the proximal tubular cells where 125 is made. However, the increased PTH, although it is bad for bones, also helps in the early stages of CKD to stimulate production of 125 by the failing kidneys, counteracting the other factors we just talked about. Another thing that happens as CKD progresses is that metabolic acidosis tends to develop because a failing kidney cannot keep up with the excretion of metabolically generated hydrogen ion. The excess hydrogen ion is buffered by bicarbonate but also makes its way into cells, including bone cells, causing cations such as calcium to be released, ultimately weakening the bones even more. Meanwhile, the decrease in 125 synthesis results in decreased bone turnover. So between the increased bone reabsorption from too much PTH and buffering of excess hydrogen ion and the decreased formation from too little 125, renal osteodystrophy, or disordered bone growth, develops. What are the clinical manifestations of the bone and mineral disturbances in CKD? We group these together loosely under the name CKD Mineral and Bone Disorder, or CKD-MBD, which includes the renal osteodystrophy that we just talked about and more. The three major manifestations of CKD-MBD are these. The most common is osteitis fibrosa cystica, or high turnover bone disease associated with high PTH levels. Histologically, it's characterized by fibrosis of the bone marrow, hence fibrosa, and by a high bone turnover rate with increased activity of both osteoclasts, which reabsorb bone, and osteoblasts, which lay down bone. In this bone biopsy, the red is unmineralized osteoid and the blue is mineralized bone. 
Here's a multinucleated osteoclast eating away at bone, and here's a line of cuboidal osteoblasts laying down mineralized bone on osteoid. Here's a closer view of a pair of osteoclasts, and you can also see the strands of collagen in the fibrotic bone marrow, which contributes to the anemia of CKD. Clinically, patients develop lytic lesions, hence cystica, from the PTH-stimulated bone reabsorption, which translates to osteopenia and fractures. Here's an example of salt and pepper skull with innumerable tiny lytic lesions. Here the bones appear to be washed out and to have decreased density, and you can see that both femoral necks are fractured. Also, if you look closely, you'll notice lytic lesions in the femurs. Less commonly seen is low turnover bone disease, which includes adynamic bone disease, usually associated with decreased PTH levels, as well as osteomalacia, which is often associated with vitamin D deficiency. The reasons for development of adynamic bone disease are unclear, but risk factors include diabetes, and it has been shown that advanced glycosylation end products suppress osteoblast activity and PTH secretion. Another risk factor seems to be the use of phosphate binders and or vitamin D analogs contributing to PTH suppression and perhaps oversuppression. Here the bone has very little activity, and on histology you'll see lots of unmineralized osteoid, not much evidence of osteoblasts or clasts, and also very little activity in the marrow space. Clinically, patients with adynamic bone disease have low PTH, may experience bone pain, and have fractures. Third, we have metastatic calcification, which tends to occur when the product of calcium times phosphate in the blood exceeds 55. Normal serum calcium is around 9 mg per deciliter and phosphate around 4, so the normal product is around 36 to 40. But when the product exceeds 55, usually because of a high phosphate level, calcium and phosphate begin to precipitate, forming crystals that deposit sometimes irreversibly in various tissues, such as the conjunctivi, giving red eye and a gritty feeling in the eye, blood vessels, here are the digital arteries of the fingers, and around joints, such as the shoulder, the ankle, and the fingers. And finally, what can we do to prevent or treat CKD mineral and bone disorder? There are several ways that we can try to intervene in this scheme of things. Since an increase in phosphate is one of the key initial disturbances, we ask patients to limit their dietary phosphate intake and to take oral phosphate binders which bind phosphorus in the gut and keep it from being absorbed. Since a low serum calcium is the direct stimulus to PTH secretion, we can give calcium supplements, although we don't do this if the serum phosphorus is very high because this may result in an increased calcium phosphate product and precipitate metastatic calcification. Lack of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3 can be remedied by administering synthetic D3 or one of its analogs. And since high PTH is the central cause of osteitis fibrosa cystica, PTH secretion can be inhibited by use of an oral calcium-sensing receptor agonist called sinacalcet. But in extreme cases, subtotal parathyroidectomy may be needed to reduce PTH levels. So in summary, CKD mineral and bone disorder is usually characterized by hyperparathyroidism and bone reabsorption, as well as the potential for metastatic calcification associated with a high calcium phosphate product. Patient compliance is key in preventing and treating the manifestations of this complex and disabling complication of CKD.